Hello and welcome to today's webinar focusing on how the telecoms industry can ensure the resilience of the global network supply chain. With COVID-19 showing just how important connectivity is for a functioning economy and society, this issue is more important than ever. If you have any questions for the panel, please do share them throughout the discussion. You can post these in the control panel that should be on the right hand side of your screen. Um, all that remains for me to say is thank you for joining us today. Uh, I will now hand over to our moderator, Dimitris Mavrakis, Research Director at ABI Research, who will begin today's dis discussion. Over to you, Dimitris. Thank you very much, Chris. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining our discussion today. I'm Dimitris Mavrakis. I'm a Research Director for ABI Research. I'm an analyst. And I will be the moderator for today's discussion, which focuses on uh, the global supply chain for telecom networks and how we can ensure that this remains resilient to handle many things in the pandemic. Now, a housekeeping note is that uh, if you'd like to submit a question, there is a question box, so please feel free to do so. We will be happy to take questions from the audience and discuss them. Uh, another uh, important note is that here we're not going to discuss politics or perhaps the effects of the trade discussions between different nations. Here we're here to discuss about the supply chain, the global telecom supply chain, and perhaps on a positive aspect. How can we, the telecoms industry, ensure that the supply chain remains on a positive growth curve? And to do so, we have a team of excellent panelists. We have uh, Luis Alverino from uh, Altis, Portugal. We have Adrian Scrais from Etsy who is very much involved in the standard setting process. And last but not least, we have Professor Sally Eves, who is a Forbes Technology CTO. So perhaps starting with Luis, can you present very briefly about your work and what you're interested in currently? Yeah, good morning, you all. Uh, so I'm the CTIO of uh, Altis Portugal. Altis Portugal is the former uh, Portugal Telecom incumbent after the acquisition of uh, Portugal Telecom by the Altis Group back in July 2015. So as a CTIO, I have the responsibility of running uh, all the networks uh, that are managed uh, and owned by Altis uh, in Portugal, um, and also all the IT systems, uh, hardware and software that that we use not only for our internal work but also to provide uh, services to to our customers very good so Luis, you could say that this topic has affected your line of work directly right so yeah very, very very it's quite true okay uh, very good. we you 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 can i think that everybody knows today and uh, there is some credit that the, the telecom industry has got during all this uh, pandemic situation uh, because in some way uh, telecom was uh, one of the key pillars of the of the society of the markets of the countries uh, and it was also due to telecommunication networks that uh, we were able to be working as we are doing today in this webinar, uh, working from from home, uh, almost with almost no impact on our day by day working. Okay, of course, it was a very stressful situation being at home with the kids, with the family, with everything like that. But I think that uh, telecoms proved that uh, there is no way of uh, uh, managing our lives and uh, managing our work without a good telecommunication services. And I think that this topic of uh, the, the key supply chain uh, items related to telecom and the telecom industry uh, is, uh, let's say, quite important and it's a, a very hot topic in this moment. Very good. Thank you, Luis. Now, then we have Adrian Scrace from Etsy, who is, as I said earlier, very much involved in the standard setting process. So Adrian, can you speak a few words about yourself? Yes, thank you, Demetrius. Um, I'm Adrian Scrace, the CTI of Etsy, responsible for the operational aspects of the day-to-day -day production of standards within the Institute. Uh, I also play a leading role in the day-to-day -day management of the partnership project 3GPP. So in the context of uh, telecommunications networks, very much involved in the standard setting uh, scenario. 
So uh, arguably the most important standard setting organization for cellular networks globally. So very good. The combination of Etsy and 3GPP collectively, yes. Correct. So. Correct. Very good. So, and last but not least, uh, Sally, can you uh, present yourself very briefly? Yes, of course. Welcome, everybody. Lovely to be here. I'm Professor Sally Eves, and probably three main pillars describe what I do. So, one is emergent technology, so former CTO in European telecoms. I'm also an emergent technology professor for universities and passionate about impact. So how we can build digital transformation for business, particularly through supply chain, but also for society and social impact too. And I really think telecoms has come to the fore massively over the COVID-19 experience. So really looking forward to sharing my thoughts today too. So very good, thank you, Sally. So we have three different points of view here. So we have Luis, who is actually a buyer for telecom networks. We have Adrian, who is in the standard setting process and Sally who is looking at it perhaps from an academic perspective and I'm the analyst. So we have a, a, an interesting three very interesting points of view here. So to kick off the discussion I have a question for the group. I actually have a list of questions but we can start with uh, I guess the most um, basic one the foundation. So to start with before we dive into supply chain can we discuss what the pillars of telecom networks are and how these pillars have allowed telecom networks to operate, especially during the pandemic? Perhaps starting with Luis. Yeah, okay. So I think I think that uh, I would say that uh, the, 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 key, the key pillars of, the, of the, our industry are clearly technology. Okay, so we are, we are in a business that is uh, technology intensive. Uh, as service providers, we have to deal with uh, with technology uh, every day. Uh, not only the fixed networks, the, the mobile networks, all the and and for the, for the, the 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 more advanced telcos, going up in the value chain of service provisioning. So going up to the clouds to, to, to cloud services, uh, getting a little bit outside of the traditional uh, connectivity connectivity services so it's a technology intensive uh, business that that we are managing every day so uh, i think i think that the, the key pillars of technology of course it's main it's highly innov it's a highly innovative uh, market these days so technology uh, we used to say that it's not a question of uh, uh, being changing every day it's the pace of change that uh, normally is changing every day. So faster and faster technology changes and innovations on products and services that we have to do because uh, differentiation in, in terms of service provisioning, it's quite important for the market, okay? Uh, differentiation not only on on the packages that you sell, but on also in the in the configuration of the services, especially when you address uh, small and medium enterprises uh, uh, areas. Okay, for the consumer side, it's more, so to say, bread and butter. Okay, quite quite equal for everyone. Okay, although we tend to have packages addressing uh, either more traffic uh, or uh, less channels on the TV and so on. So for the for the for the consumer uh, but for the for the for the enterprises especially SMEs and um, small and medium business it's quite it's quite relevant the the amount of uh, expertise that you have to have uh, and also the amount of customization that you have to provide so processes and uh, so to say product management it's uh, also another another pillar that is quite quite important okay and i would say that the the last pillar that is uh, let's say highly important in this kind of business is to have the full knowledge about the technology uh, in order to run this technology and put this technology available to everyone uh, at the best cost and as fast as possible. So having in mind this, all the value chain of providing technology to our services, processes, uh, and so to, so to say, software and hardware available at the right time with the right capacity. Uh, so 
and the knowledge of the networks that we that we have to to have it's quite it's quite it's quite important and often i, I we, we could also say that you know many will argue that operators are not innovative or they are you know amazon and google and apple are innovating but if we think about it, none of these innovations would be possible without this consistent mobile broadband fabric that operators have deployed now. And to, of course, certainly, uh, if there wasn't for a global standard that 3GPP has uh, developed for many years. So perhaps from your perspective, Adrian, uh, can you describe you know, the standards setting process and how this is a key pillar for uh, mobile broadband networks globally? I mean, fortunately, we're, we're in an industry which is very much standards based and it's it's taken us a few years to get there, but I think we've got there now. If you look in other industries, they don't have that characteristic, but we do. Um, but one misconception is that if you have a standard and you procure standard compliant products, that's the end of the business. Well, of course, that's only the starting point. So you, you procure standards compliant products, uh, but it's then incumbent on you to deploy those products in a smart way and then to operate those in a smart way. And what sits uh, across the top of those three um, axes uh, is this concept of test, test and test again. Now, if you get standards excellence, if you get technical excellence, it's normally because you've done those three things. You've procured the right equipment you've deployed it in the right way and you operate it in the right way. But if you get one of those attributes wrong, then you don't get standards or technical excellence. Fortunately, we have a standard setting environment, which is currently uh, all encompassing. We have more than 700 member companies taking part in setting this standard if we look at the mobile um, arena only. And what really leads to the standards excellence is that during this process of procurement, deployment and operations, we have a continuous feedback loop which comes back into the standards body that says, um, we bought this compliant product, we installed it in what we thought was a smart way, and these are the problems we encountered. And then we try and fix those uh, problems encountered, which may just be um, different deployers interpreting the standard in a different way because it was ambiguous. And then the, what leads to the standards excellence is having that feedback loop so we correct those ambiguities. But the key to the whole of this is that we have um, everybody who's involved in this process participating on fair, equal terms in a standard setting arena. And it's that inclusiveness that really leads us to the maturity that you're seeing uh, with today's network. And perhaps we should also say that you know, participation in 3GBP is a truly global uh, matter, right? So we, you, I bet there are companies from all around the world working together for a consensus-based standard, right, Adrian? Uh, at the last count, I, I could see participating companies from 45 different territories. So, yeah, Very it's, it's Very good. really global. And I believe that Sally, you've done some work on uh, recent work on looking at the global supply chain, right, for telecoms. Absolutely, absolutely. And kind of going back to, to the main question in terms of this pillar, the two main things would stand out for me. So you know, communications and connectivity has been probably never more vital over that time and probably two main drivers for that. One around data centers so the drive for computing capacity, computing speed and power. Uh, and also the pressure on networks, you know, traffic growth, congestion, we need that stability, con continuity and security. I think we've seen some great examples of tech organizations coming together over that time, working more closely with academia and research and really closing some gaps. And the vital pillar for that has been this telecom connectivity. And I really hope that one of the legacies from the COVID-19 experience is to continue that. So absolutely the technology, but also supporting that, it's culture, it's collaboration, and it's open sharing. That's been a real, real change maker. So something like the HPC Consortium, as one example, is a great way where tech organizations across the world have really made a difference and given their access to their, to their computing power to make a difference there. But also um, financial flexibility. Again, a number of organizations across China, US and Europe have stepped up to help people over this time so they can make use of the technology as well. So it is this holistic but kind of integrated effort to come together that's really kept us all you know, working, 
living obviously at home and learning, every aspect of our life has changed in ways I don't think we could have conceived at the start of the year. Without this backbone, you know, we would have, we would have had real difficulties. It made a tremendous difference. So there is a joke going around that it's neither the CEO nor the CTO of companies that have pushed for digital transformation. It's actually COVID-19. So <laughs> COVID-19 in three months has achieved much more than any other digital transformation initiative has in the fact. And actually, and that is a real argument for a global supply chain in any industry, not only uh, telecoms. So going to the next question is about these issues. So COVID-19 and also geopolitics. Uh, a question to all three panelists is, how do you see uh, this having affected the telecom supply chain from your perspective? And perhaps starting again from Luis, who I guess is a buyer of infrastructure. How, this, how has this affected your daily work? I think I think that one one of the one of the, the big problems that we faced in the during this pandemic situation was the again the speed of reaction that we had to had um, let's say almost almost managing the network uh, managing the traffic flows uh, increasing capacity. Uh, looking at the congestion points on, on the network, uh, diverting traffic from one side to the other, um, that that was requested for us as uh, telecom operators to act on, almost in on a real time. You, you know that our, our industry and and our organization as the so-called planning area for which you look at trends of traffic that normally you observe on a time frame or three months is six months is one year, three years and things like that. Okay, we, I would say that we changed completely during those last three to four months is the way, the we, the way we act in, 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 the, in the planning domain, okay, it was more uh, almost as a real time planning uh, as normally uh, in the in the market today, you you don't you don't do this strategic planning. Uh, there is there is there is a there is a, a, a kind of concept that is called uh, rolling forecasting. Okay, so that means that you have to forecast and you have to implement and you have to reforecast and you have to do all your planning cycles and your implementation cycles uh, almost every week and almost every day. I, I have to share with you that, of course, that the figures that I'm going to share with uh, you all are, are quite similar in almost every country. Uh, first of all, uh, in, this, in, this, in this case, uh, in this pandemic uh, situation, it was not the mobile networks that were stressed. It were mm. the fixed networks that were stressed. Why? People was at home, okay? Probably with good Wi-Fi coverage at home, okay? And good uh, fixed landline uh, connectivity. So it was the, the, the fixed networks that were highly stressed and not the mobile networks. Cloud applications also highly stressed, okay? Because we had to implement very fast VPNs for, for, the, for, the, for the enterprises. For ourselves, uh, we had to move in, in our case, in Altis, Portugal, we had to move something like 7,500 to 8,000 people within a time frame of one to two weeks from the office to home. So you can imagine that the kind of planning and the kind of action in real time that we had to have, okay? Traffic, fra traffic flows, internet access, and, and, and things like that increased almost three digits. 80 to 85 percent growth vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the previous week, and this was something that had a, that had a very strong impact on the overall of the overall su supply chain associated with provisioning and assuring that the, the, the networks were up and running and with good reliability and with good capacity. Okay, so it was it was clearly. Um, uh, a, a way and a moment that we had to uh, prove ourselves that 
a, a set of topics associated to the overall supply chain of implementing, uh, providing, installing, operating networks uh, as to run as smoothly as possible. And a set of a set of items that we will most probably be discussing about the diversification of vendors that we had to use in these cases. And I think that the topic about standardization, it, will, it is very important for us to have, uh, let's say, a more flexible supply chain, because once you have uh, standardized uh, um, products, services, technology, you have much more possibility of choosing uh, what are your partners and what are your, your vendors. So the diversification, the, the, the reliability concepts that we had to apply to the to the networks okay and also um, the possibility and the to exercise a concept that is quite important in in the supply chain that is partnerships if you don't do forecasts if you don't partner with your vendors okay it is almost impossible to have a good process associated with a, a supply chain that does not disturb uh, your activity in these critical situations. Mm. Very good points, Luis. And in fact, we could say that during COVID, the last thing that the telecoms industry needed was this geopolitical situation, right? So I guess to handle the increased load and demands for you know the consumer and business domain, it was necessary for the supply chain to come together and I guess the geopolitical situation was very ill, or perhaps you could say that COVID-19 was very ill-timed because geopolitical concerns came first. But anyway. Yeah, that's true. Sorry, sorry Dimitri, just, just to mention uh, the last bullet that is. And this is much more important in the actual moment because the supply chain is completely global. Okay, so we have, we cannot, we, there, there is a quote that normally we use that to say that is, well, the world is just a small village today. Okay, mm -hmm. it's no, no longer this, uh, let's say, big world in which we are living. This is a global village. Okay, and the, the supply chain is much more global. Okay, the, 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 num the num much more fragmented because the number of parties that you have to involve on the supply chain, uh, it's much higher, okay? And I think, again, I will stress that the, stand, the standardization of technology, being either software or hardware, mobile or fixed, has played a very important role in mm. the possibility of having more parties, partners involved in the global supply chain. That's right. So the the reason i ask this question is because in our discussions with many cto's uh, we we sense a bit of stress with this confusion because at the moment with you know both the pandemic and geopolitics they cannot see they don't have full visibility in the future of the supply chain for example previously they could choose whoever vendor they could you know, based on technology or commercial or other uh, mm -hmm. KPIs. But now it seems that politics or state statemanship or state issues are coming into this equation. And this is something beyond their control. And we have heard cases where 5G deployments have uh, stalled or stopped completely until the situation is resolved. And this is perhaps a key question to discuss. Because previously, uh, before these issues, these global issues, they, the telecoms industry was progressing in a linear way. So, I guess standards in 3GPP, then you know vendors, both big and small, were developing their infrastructure, and then telcos carriers could select anyone they preferred on many KPIs. But now this is restricted. So. If we look at the, the positive aspect on globalization, right? So how important this is? Perhaps, you know, Sally, you can discuss about globalization in general and how this applies to telecoms specifically. 
Yeah, absolutely. And may I make just a very quick follow up point to what you were saying just then as well. I think it's brought to the fore for me, um, just Louise's points about um, partnership, absolutely key, I think. But also, I think it's brought to the fore that going forward from this for supply chain, I think diverse sources, digitalization is absolutely key to being stronger together, being smarter around supply chain, because we've seen how fragile in certain cases and how interdependent everything is. So I want to just kind of do a little follow up point on that as well. But yeah, in terms of globalization, I mean, we've gained so much from that. I think obviously in levels of innovation would be one of those most definitely. If you look at the level of, of patent development that's happened even over the last year, um, just leading up to, to the announcements around COVID has been absolutely critical. Um, I think there's more patents in the semiconductor industry, for example, and also in the memory space than in any other. So it, it really shows how much of a catalyst this industry is. Um, and I think if we go forward, we need to look at keeping up that momentum. You know, we've been doing things faster, smaller, cheaper. That's democratizing access to opportunity, not just for business, but for, for society too. And you mentioned about 5G. You know, this was going to be the year that we went far more mainstream with 5G adoption. Now, COVID-19 will obviously have an impact on that in all the ways we've discussed already, but also around consumers as well. I think now that's going to head into 2021, but we can't lose that momentum. You know, I'm involved in projects in Africa, for example, the implementation, sorry, implementation of 5G, but also advancing of other network infrastructures is a huge beneficial. You know, we've seen digital equity gaps over this period of time, and those gaps get bigger. Um, but if we put the right foundations in place, that right foundations of infrastructure, we can close those gaps and really democratize opportunities. So for me, this technology um, infrastructure through tech um, through telecoms is absolutely pivotal. I don't want us to lose that momentum. So collaboration, partnership, where we have got difficulties working together to resolve those through greater dialogue, I think are absolutely key. Now, as an example, I'm, I'm leading an event at Cambridge Judge later on this year. So we've delayed it slightly because of the COVID situation, but it's coming out in the autumn where we're getting 30 uh, leaders through different telecom companies, through academia, through civil society, through government, across all the different regions of the world, talking around building global governance and addressing the issues transparently and trying to work together effectively to build like a, a model of trust that can work. I think this dialogue is absolutely key. So yeah, just a key kind of points from me, drawing on what we've talked about earlier and then the follow-up kind of area we're just drawing into. So yeah, I think that's key. Any comments here, Adrian? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think Sally's actually covered the, uh, the subject very well. Okay, very good. So perhaps, Sally, a follow-up uh, question for your points is about the semiconductor supply chain. And I guess if we look at the broader context of this uh, technology, is much bigger than 5G or any particular technology area. So if this, you know, the current landscape for both COVID and geopolitics extends to the semiconductor area, do you expect that this will affect consumers like you and I and carriers and businesses to a, a greater extent? Absolutely, because of particularly the independency that I mentioned earlier, the semiconductor industry has been a catalyst for so much innovation. Um, so if there is disruptive there, um, it will affect so many different areas um, and cost will be one of the impacts, but also slowing down of innovation. I think that would be a great shame. Again, drawing on the COVID experience, we've seen how much of a difference we can make. And if we pull back from that, I mean, just, just one example that's close to me because I was involved in it. We had a lot of industries that were in manufacturing that switched completely to manufacture equipment. You know, the PPP shortages, ventilators, things like that. Semiconductor is a, a part and parcel of so much of what we do. If we, if we break the distribution around that, we will hold back so much development in so many different sectors. So again, it's about building that dialogue where there are problems, having openness and, and discussing them. But we, we need to be careful um, about what the long-term innovation effect will be, and like I say, end cost and reducing the access, sorry, the access to equal opportunity to use these innovations. I think that really concerns me. I agree, and I think that the the entry barrier for any new company into the semiconductor supply chain is very long. It's very big barrier, so we cannot say that, say, a country or a region can create innovation in a matter of two or three or even five years so maintaining a global supply chain is vital for semiconductors much bigger uh, much of bigger importance compared to 5g and any other say telecom technology absolutely absolutely and, and that you know if, if we start to slow down the r d investment and the catch-up time 
is huge. So I, I think, you know, they say my, for me, the legacy of the COVID-19 experience is how we can come together, how we can accelerate the research curve, look what we've done with vaccines, you know, things that, and, and treatment developments, things that would normally take seven to eight weeks to get to the same stage. So in only five, 15 to 18 months to get to the same stage, we've done it in five to nine weeks in certain cases in terms of the acceleration of innovation. Um, we're doing so much in terms of bringing that curve forward. We don't want to be doing things where we're bringing those innovation curves back again. I think we can learn from that experience of what we can do when we come together and take that forward into other sectors such as this. Right. And I think a particular uh, example, again, is the semiconductor supply chain, mm -hmm. which is, again, truly global. So Absolutely. innovations are uh, spread throughout the world, and it's this collaboration between different regions that has created these innovations. And if we think about it, uh, for example, in the mobile domain, the past 10 or 15 years are, have been the explosion of technology. And the other day I was reading about M-Pesa in Kenya, which is a mobile banking platform that was actually launched in 2007 using 2G. And now it's responsible for 50% of Kenya's GDP. That was only 13 years ago. So. I fully agree with you, Sally, the exponential innovation we've seen across many domains, not only mobile or say 4G or 5G, is perhaps because of you know, advances in semiconductors and miniaturization and making semiconductors more, more, more cost effective. So moving on to a more positive, uh, <laughs> a more actionable and positive discussion is how can the industry collaborate to mitigate those risks of say protection trade protectionism and you know uh, fragmenting this global supply chain uh, perhaps adrian uh, from your perspective from a standards perspective uh, from a standards perspective um i think i'll make two points i mean COVID is something completely new and it's something we haven't experienced in modern history Whereas geopolitics is nothing new, it's always been there and it will always be there. Um, so it, 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 we're not facing this for the, for the first time. Um, and we've, we see over time, it'll be a different country, a different region, a different continent that comes to the foreground, but it doesn't matter, it's still geopolitics and it's not going to go away. So from a standards point of view, whilst we cannot and will not have any geopolitical view, it's incumbent on us to make sure that we don't allow the interference of geopolitics into the standard setting machinery. And, and in more recent times, we've seen that there is a risk of that happening. But, you know, it's, it's my duty, our duty to make sure that that platform remains open, fair and equitable to all players. Um, and that, that's the, the most urgent risk that I've seen, at least in recent months, is the risk that we deny certain players access to that standard setting machinery. And that will be absolutely disastrous for, for many reasons, which I, we can go into if you wish. But um, from my point of view, what, what is foremost, at least in my mind, is making sure that as standard bodies, we keep that equity, that fair and reasonable place on a level playing field to come and contribute your intellectual property to, to writing the best technical standards we can. And that in writing those standards, we always choose the very best results from R&D. Mm -hmm. We don't choose them because of some political interference or influence that, that tips the playing field in favour of one country or region. So I think that, to me, it's rather clear what my duty is, at least in terms of uh, managing the, the standards bodies that I'm responsible for. I agree. I think if these issues do start to affect the standards making process, then the industry will be at a very bad um, direction. So, and of course, it will not, I guess, not choosing the best technology at that given moment will not be what's best for everyone. So, uh, Luis, any comment from your perspective here? How can we mitigate those risks from your perspective again? Yeah. I think, I think, I think that um, uh, one, 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 one of the risks, and uh, I think that Adrian, uh, as already, as already uh, highlighted that, I think that one, one of the ways to minimize risks on, on the supply chain is to work strongly on standardization. 
Uh, normally, the standardization activities uh, involve uh, very distinct players of the of the of of, of the market involved in 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 the older process, uh, ranging from uh, users to the industry players, so the manufacturers and also the companies that are using the technology and so on. Uh, today, I think, and probably Adrian can uh, confirm that or not. Today, we see that probably standards are less technology driven and much more, let's say, usage and market driven. Okay, so there is there is really uh, this kind of uh, approach to define standards that uh, are looking for what is the the best usage to make out of those standards instead of what is the technology that we are going to do with that with those standards okay so i think that standardization is one of the key pillars in order to enhance and in order to have a better supply chain uh, i think also that cooperation as i mentioned before and partnerships it's quite important once as i as i mentioned before uh, the the today's uh, value chain of the supply chain or or the network supply chain involves much more players we as telcos we no longer play or we don't want to replay again the uh, the role of the, the the overall integrator of everything uh, but we rely much more in several partnerships that we do uh, in order to bring out services uh, and look much more at services than uh, in, uh, to networks, okay? So we, again, as on the standardization domain, we look much more to the uh, usability rather than the technology side of the process. Um, and, and, I think, and I think that in, in this cooperation, I will integrate also the kind of relationship, a much more partnership relationship uh, between who is the vendor and who is the buyer. Uh, I, I used to say that I like very much, very much to do partnerships, uh, not probably in the same way my CFO likes partnerships, because uh, for, for CFOs, partnerships mean, means discounts, okay? Um, <laughs> for, me, for me as a CTO, a partnership means that I can influence the roadmap of the product. I can influence uh, the functionalities that are going to be made available by the supplier. I can influence and I can make the industry adapt much more a product to the kind of service that, I, that I'm going to sell rather than just making a product available and making me adapting to that, to that, to that kind of product. So this kind of relationship in terms of being able to share what are the forecasts that I have in order to have, because today we are, we live in a moment in which everything is just in time, okay? Today, everybody wants to have a warehouse with zero items inside, okay? But with the same flexibility and the same pace of response as if I had a huge warehouse of uh, uh, equipment that I can use from night to day okay so the kind of the cooperation uh, in terms of establishing partnerships in the sense of aligning roadmaps deploying products but also exchanging information about our forecasts our real needs so what we want to do this is quite this is quite important i would say that the last point is much related to innovation okay it's true it's true that connect for connectivity you don't have too many innovation but today as players in the market connectivity for us of course is a must but what we look much more is to the service side of the of what we do rather than the connectivity side that that, that we do so i think three or three or four three or four major items to be to be let's say very well looked at uh, in this uh, in this uh, in order to enhance and in order to make to have a better supply chain for the for the for our for our processes and our networks. Any comments here, Sally? Yeah, I think I'll just add in the importance of trust 
and how we can embed trust. I think it's one of the big talking points of our time, and I think it's massively right. important. And if anybody wants to follow up on that, I've been involved in something about how we can build, it's called, we've called it like a technology democracy and diplomacy, a new language around this to help all different stakeholders be part of the conversation, which I think is vital. I think sometimes what we're talking about, not everybody knows the different aspects about that. And you know, certain headlines can create fear. So we want to do things where we can bring different voices together concentrate on the facts about what's happening and create dialogue. You know, dialogue and inclusion, I think, are the, are the key things here and how we bed, in, bed trust in. And for example, there's been a lot of talk about AI, um, as we were all aware of, and things like the Montreal Declaration is one example. They set the principles, they set the foundations and the values of how we want to work together. So I'm also thinking the more we can do around that, not just building frameworks and talking about it, but having that as a foundation and then bringing these settings like the Cambridge event is one example as well, will make a really big difference. I'm really keen to get people from different sectors together, truly across the world and talking about these issues in a, in a calm, collaborative way so we can make, make things happen. And as I say, I think it's absolutely pivotal, not just for dis digital transformation for business, but what we can do for society and closing these gaps. Connectivity, that seamless, intelligent connectivity is absolutely vital. So I think, yeah, let's learn from this COVID experience, take the benefits that we've seen from that, what we can do together and use those forward in the semiconductor industry, but also beyond and, and build a positive contagion effect from that. That's what I would like to do. Very much so. So before we proceed, I'd like to re remind our audience to please send in your questions if you have any. We'll be happy to discuss them. We still have about 20 minutes left. And I, we do know that this is a contested topic, but we will be happy to answer any questions and discuss them. And moving to a slightly different topic is about the enterprise focus of 5G. And we did discuss here that you know, global collaboration is needed for many different aspects, but perhaps this is much a much bigger requirement in 5G, where we have enterprise uh, use cases. And if we think about it, the consumer use case is one. So we have uh, SMS, voice and data for consumers. Pretty simple globally. So every operator globally has been offering the very same products. But if we go to enterprises, even if we look at one vertical manufacturing, there are dozens of sub use cases. And here, perhaps, it is more vital for global companies to collaborate, right? For example, in Germany, an operator may have a lot of experience in the manufacturing domain and may provide this expertise to other regions or in other countries, in, for example, in Silicon Valley. There may be high tech learnings there applied to different areas. So I guess pivoting the discussion to 5G and enterprise, do you see a bigger need for global collaboration? And perhaps starting with Adrian, with uh, standards discussions. And I know that SA6 in 3GPP is discussing enterprise requirements. So do you expect that there will be a much bigger need for global collaboration in 5G? I mean, that's a really interesting question. I mean, 5G, if you really want to characterize 5G, it is, it is exactly as you've just described it. It's no longer a system designed for citizens. You know, it is a system that's designed to satisfy a whole multitude of, of end use cases. Um, and starting with the, the standards philosophy, from the very outset, we determined that we should not try and uh, prejudge how these standards would be deployed. So in previous generations, we've, uh, we've tried to understand who will be the end beneficiary and design the system around them. In 5G, we decided that was too big a question to answer and that our standards should be written in such a way that um, they are available to be deployed in whichever scenario you, you wish them to be deployed. So in that context, the standards could be deployed in a uh, sort of a citizen environment, in an enterprise environment. It could be deployed by a public network operator. It could be a private deployment by the enterprise itself. So the, the, the standard enables um, all of those opportunities and it opens up huge opportunities then to be creative in the way that you want to deploy your standard. But what we see, and, and I'm glad you mentioned Germany because that's, um, a very good example of seeing sort of out-of-the-box thinking about how to deploy these standards. 
with a strong push towards um, digitizing the manufacturing industry yeah. with allocating spectrum, which can be now acquired by companies and allowing enterprises companies to actually manage their own networks rather than um, be uh, bound to, to use the public network operator. But if you want to go along those routes, as, as we've said on this panel more than once, partnerships become increasingly dependent. I mean, you must have a very good understanding if you are an enterprise wishing to deploy your own 5G network. I mean, you've got an awful lot to learn if you, if you want to become a private network operator. And you will only do that by establishing partnerships with the right players. So yeah, at the risk of repeating myself, I mean, the, from a standard point of view, we are there to enable all possibilities. From a deployment point of view, if you want to think out of the box and do something different, that will only be achievable by very good partnerships with the right players. Correct, global partnerships. So any comments here, Sally? Well, I certainly echo a lot of the comments that Adrian said there, and it also reminded me of, I'm writing something at the moment about how we move from um, how we actualize, you know, things like, for example, the smart city, we're starting to see a real actualization of that, although it's been something that's been talked about for many, many years. But now we've got the confluence and the integration of different forms of technology to actually make that reality. And really at the hub of that, we do have 5G so to make the, the potential, the momentum we had going into this year. Obviously, we've had we've had the difficulty we've discussed. I'm looking at 2021 now as being the heralding point for that. I'm looking at you know, one of the things I'm doing with the UN and UNESCO is how we move from the concept of smart city to smart society. So again, digital inclusion, digital connectivity, financial inclusion, all that is underpinned by the infrastructure provided by telecoms. So what we're talking about here, it's not just about the semiconductor industry, it's not just about 5G, the ripple effect from this is absolutely huge. So that key word about partnership, making the decisions for the right reasons in the right way and having that open dialogue and sharing is absolutely vital. So I couldn't stress that more because I think there's a lot, a lot at stake here for, for, for the future of society. I think if anything, this COVID experience, we've just seen, you know, the importance of human and tech in partnership and coming together in the right way. So I echo Adrian's comments and I just would just kind of stress them even more in relation to the impact that for society and, and closing gaps so we don't get further apart that we come together. Mm. And Luis, from your perspective, in uh, 5G, do you expect that global collaborations will be very important for enterprise use cases in particular? Yes, uh, yes, for sure. Um, pro probably, probably, I, I will go a little bit back uh, for a comment that you have made before. Uh, it's, it's in fact true that uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, problem uh crisis uh as let's say has not been very keen for the 5g deployments uh, all over the the world especially in portugal we have delayed already the um, the auction and the introduction of 5g i would say at least uh, six months so probably we will have 5g uh, available in portugal by the end of this year beginning of next year okay so uh, instead of uh, and and i think that in some cases in some countries depending on the situation uh, there is a similar a similar uh, situation of uh, delaying uh, the plans of introduction I, I would I would say I would say that that uh, the, that partnerships and collaboration will be uh, of paramount importance for the 5g deployment First, first of all, because I think that 5G, in some cases, it's not it's not uh, uh, an enabler of uh, of uh, digitalization or uh, new 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 services. I, I would say that I see much more 5G as an accelerator of that rather than an enabler. Okay, I would say that most of the use cases that uh, we we see today we speak about today uh, about 5g uh, in, in some cases you can do it with 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 4g okay uh, of course that there are use cases that for which you need some of the uh, functionalities or the characteristics of the 5g technology uh, such as either latency uh, or network slicing or things like that but i would say that a very high percentage of the today applications that we speak about you can do it with 4g or with uh, with 4g plus uh, technology 
So I see 5G much more as an accelerator. And by accelerating innovation and by accelerating the deployment of new use cases, you will drive innovation and you will drive the appearance of new use cases. And in order to cope with all this synergic new move in the in the process, you have to introduce uh, cooperation and you have to introduce partnerships as a way to to develop much more what what we what we have available from this from this technology. Okay. Uh, also because I think that 5G and as I mentioned before, 5G it's probably one of the first technologies that was developed having in mind our user needs, uh, the market needs, and all the expectations and all the, so to say, crazy or naive ideas that we have about what can a, what technology can do for our daily lives, okay? Um, and in fact, as you mentioned before, the um, consumer market, it's, let's say, bread and butter, it's much similar everywhere. And the enterprise market, you have, although you can define silos or verticals of applications, the kind of tuning and the kind of application, and uh, sorry, sorry, the kind of tuning and the kind of adaptability that you have to have in your applications, it's much higher than what you observe in the consumer side. So it's really important that you establish a, a very strong cooperative uh, environment for the deployment of, of this kind of service of new services to uh, enterprises okay and we can speak about different kinds of different kinds of verticals or different kinds of types of applications and you see that even it seems exactly the same thing in fact you have one or two items in which for the same vertical that you have to adapt because you will enter much more in the overall process of the organization, the how how you manage this kind of this kind of of, of business, um, and it's not it's not really the same thing. But we can discuss a little bit more on that. So, the way we see it in our line of work at ABI is that uh, we we expect that 4G, like you say, 4G today can cater for many use cases, but we do see a separation of features comparing 4G with 5G, particularly regarding advanced uh, use cases and applications. So 4G to a certain extent is correlated with connectivity, while 5G uh, in current discussions is correlated with more advanced features. So things like uh, support for time sensitive networking or network slicing or even positioning. So I know that mm -hmm. 3GBP is discussing and introducing centimeter level positioning for indoor 5G systems, which is, if you think about it, it's a tremendous innovation for, say, for the manufacturing floor. And I, we, we are aware that there are many things happening in certain countries for 5G trials and even commercial deployments. And from our perspective, it is vital for these innovations to be shared at the global audience so that the rest of the industry can proceed, especially now that, for example, we have the topic of private networks and we have shared unlicensed or licensed spectrum, so many different options for enterprises. But from our side, we see that you know, giving a global audience, having a global audience for these use cases and advanced features of 5G is vital for enterprise 5G. And I guess this could be the same for any technology. So, any comments here, Adrian or Sally? Uh, no, I, pro I, prob I probably could, uh, could, uh, could add something because I think uh, it's, 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 it's the other side of the coin, okay? If you, if you, look, at, if you look at the pace of uh, technology introduction in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in an operator network, okay? The, the the time to to that we take today to cover 100% of uh, of the network okay with a specific technology and if you look at 2g 3g 4g okay it's declined probably it took to you 10 years to 
have 100% of, of a country covered with 2G. Probably it took to you seven years to have the same coverage with 3G. Probably it took to you five years for, 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 for 4G. So the, the, the amount of time that, that takes you to adopt a new technology and to make that available to the end customer, it's slow, it's smaller and smaller and smaller. So that mm -hmm. means that the amount of time that, that, that you have to completely have the, the return on, on, on the investment that you make, it's also every day smaller. So the way, the way that, we, that, that, we can, that, that we have to have in order to have a better return on investment, because investments are higher and higher and higher, okay? The, 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 the only way it's to extend cooperation, share knowledge about the use cases that are being successful, okay? Because in the end, we are companies and we live to make profit. Okay, mm. uh, and in order to in order to make that possible, we have to have access not only to the best technology but also to the best use cases that allow us to make money out of the networks that we make available and the services that we make available to our customers. So, again, cooperation, uh, sharing information, partnerships—it's crucial for the success of these new deployments of technologies. And can I add to that quickly as well about where the drivers of innovation are coming from? And I think we're seeing different drivers now as well. So the consumers themselves, the wider civil society, um, people are looking for more open innovation, I think. And in terms of business models, a more shared values approach where you can do well by doing good. So I think people want to see that commitment to sharing, to partnership, but also where that's being put to. So they want to see the acceleration in, you know, better experience on what we're using in our devices. They want to see that the benefits that 5G can bring for there, but they want to see benefits in the local community and across the world as well. So I think there's a pivot now. Uh, I really see that it's not just Generation Z. I think it's going further. And the COVID experience, I think, will just heighten that even further. So there's shared value models. So for me, it's not just return on investment. It's return on social investment too. So I actually think a lot of consumers themselves will be driving for this change to see better collaboration, to embed trust, to work together, be more transparent, bring different people into the conversation um, so that we can change the narrative, not just around 5G, but tech in general, about what we can do when we come together and really how we can genuinely harness harness this as a real force for good so that's kind of my kind of take on that sorry thank you just wanted to come in on that one no that's a very fair point uh, sally and perhaps this is even more vital because this is a confusing time for everyone and i guess no one can predict what will happen next in the very same way that no one could predict that some conspiracy theorists correlated 5G with the spread of COVID and started burning up masts, right? So now it's more important than ever for the telecoms industry to be uniform and together in handling COVID and many other challenges. But I do believe we have come up to the top of the hour. Uh, any closing comments from our panelists? I think we have a, a great discussions so far. Adrian, go ahead, please. Just maybe one anecdotal note to finish on, because taking in mind uh, what Lewis has said, if we look at 5G as an interesting study, we commence work on the real standard setting around about 2015. It was September 2015. And at that time, all the operators said to us, um, you need to slow down because we don't need 5G anytime soon. So. Uh, you know, 2020 will be absolutely fine for us. Uh, it wasn't any more than a year or so we were into the work when we got the opposite message saying, you've got to slow up, you've got to speed up. Your standard <laughs> bodies are far too slow. We want this 2017, you know. Oh. Uh, so yeah. what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that you know, we no longer have the luxury of setting ourselves big timescales to do things, that the market is changing so quickly that from the standards body through to the product developers through to the implementers, this whole concept of long-term planning sort of goes out the window, I think. We just need to be so much more agile in our thinking. And, and that's, we've said, look, we're not going to start 6G, that's 2030. 
it's my bet that in two or three years time we'll be starting with 6g standards because the industry is going to say come on get on with it we've already yeah. done five um so we, we, what i'm trying to make is I, I just think trying to predict long time scales in this business is over and we just need to be so much more agile in our thinking and adaptable and coping with whatever situation is thrown before us and i think to summarize the good messages we've heard on the panel we no one expected covid that came out of the blue and I think our industry adapted incredibly well in delivering um, the, the backbone, if you like, to enable society to continue. Because without the telecom networks, we'd have been in an awful mess. Indeed. Very That's good. Fun. So, very good. So, uh, Adrian, Sally, and Luis, thank you very much for the very interesting discussions. I believe this concludes our webinar today. Thank you very much everyone for attending and we'll be happy to answer any potential questions you have over email. Thank you very much. Yeah. Morning.